Okay, now we're in 11J, and I hope you see a, a pattern here. There are key words that Paul is using to characterize the time, all right, that is signified by this, these syllables, which are standing for years. And they are based on Christ's lifetime from birth, so they form an Anno Domini accounting. The key word here was pater, father, and that was what people were calling Augustus. And that's, of course, what Christ is calling his own father. And that's what we say when we are born again, father. Okay? We saw how when Augustus died, the key word in the second clause was curiu. That's when Christ, you know, as it were, became master of himself by the time he was an adult, actually by the time he was 13. And by the time he was 13, that's when Augustus was deified. So you see these little clever keywords. This is a major feature of Greek drama. Okay, Paul is using, in fact, um, the epic meter, the tens and the twenties. These are epic meter syllables. But he's also borrowing from Greek drama because he's writing the Greeks, okay? It would be meaningful to them. This play on single words, okay? They did this all the time in their plays, and Shakespeare does it too. Um, and, and this would make it very, very meaningful and memorable to the Greeks. It's kind of a pity that it isn't that way for us, but hopefully I'm, you're getting somewhat interested in the individual words and wordplay when you see this. This is when Augustus is deified. This is when Christ becomes master of himself, as it were. You know, it's one thing to be perfect, but you can be perfect and small. He's got to be perfect and big enough to carry sins. Okay, so he's got to become master of himself, and that way he becomes Lord and Master. So you see this, this kind of dual entendre play going on here. In our third clause, the, the key phrase here is uh, eulogesas, and that's 27 AD, and it was a blessing to the world, in particular the Roman Empire, because that's what Paul is tracking, that Tiberius died here, because Tiberius was really, in his last years, he was really a problem, okay? And, um, not Tiberius, um, I'm sorry, um, bleh. Augustus dies here, Tiberius is still ruling here, this is when Pontius Pilate comes to power, and you have to argue that it was something of a blessing because Pilate didn't think Christ was guilty. Okay, God takes into account every minute detail of things. Okay, and it was a blessing for us that Christ was here. I covered that. But the key word here is blessing, eulogesas, as a participle. And then, of course, the key word here is in pasulogia. This is when Christ is actually in heaven at the, at the end, eulogie. Um, I. This is date of case here. I always forget to read the iota subscript. Um, and he dies at 33. Okay. Tiberius goes really bad in his last years. And he dies in 37. And that was a blessing, a spiritual blessing, in many ways, just a plain blessing, just for the sake of it, to Pilate. Because Pilate was, was supposed to, was on his way, he was literally on his way back to Rome. He had been recalled by Rome for allegedly misbehaving with respect to the Jews. They accused him. So he's on his way back to Rome to face charges, and Tiberius dies, and as far as I know, the charges were dropped. Okay, or, or he didn't get he didn't get penalized or something. So he ended up getting blessed out of that because Tiberius died. And it was a blessing to Rome, too, because in the beginning years, Caligula was a nice guy. Okay, he was, he, he was ruling okay until he went wacko. Okay, so blessing, the, the, the pasiologia, really is a pregnant meaning here. Okay, and obviously the spiritual blessing comes to us at Pentecost. Okay, so, so it's benchmarked here for when Tiberius dies. And benchmark for when you know Pilate gets off the hook. So God blessed him for blessing Christ. I mean, you know, he still allowed it to happen, but he was really between a rock and a hard place. Okay. So um, 
that was that's very evocative there. And then then here Caligula comes to power at the very end, and so and and Toy Sepul, that's Caligula, that's all that that he's got. Okay, and he was bad at this point. Okay, mostly right in here these last two years. But he wasn't, he wasn't as bad as he could have been because Agrippa talked him out of, you know, wanting to put his statue in the temple at Jerusalem. And before he got a chance to do that or think it over again, God took him. He died. All right? So that was Uranias ruling, see, in heaven where Christ is. Okay? Now, the guy that wanted to restore heaven succeeded Caligula named Claudius. Claudius basically banned the Jews from uh, Rome and banned the Christians to a certain extent. Um, they, he banned them. Well that was kind of a blessing too because in Rome you couldn't get the doctrine as easily as you could. You know I mean Paul himself was just beginning to form up here. You know, 44 A.D. was when basically when Paul was finally coming into his own. This is the period during which Paul himself was saved. Well, he was actually saved back here, okay, after Christ's death. So it was really in here. Numatiki came true for Paul, so he must have been laughing when he wrote this, okay. And um, at the same time, uh, in an effort to go back to... Um, traditional Roman society, Claudius was really big on that. That's why he banned the Jews and he banned the Christians. Well, that was a blessing because then they could get closer to who? Christ. By going to the provinces where there was a lot more freedom. Okay? So, Uranias, Uranios, rather, my bad American accent, um, was behind that. You see? So, that's the key word here, right here. All right, and this is again. This was the time when Paul's ministry really, you know, took off in this in this section right here. So being banned to the provinces was the best thing that could happen to you as a Jew or a Christian. Okay, you would have to go out to the provinces, and then you'd really get, you know, Paul's ministry because he didn't come to um, Rome until you know when he's writing here. All right. And then our key word here is katos exelexato. Okay, even as he elected us. Okay, because according to Rome, Christians were no good. Claudius was still in power at this point until the Chemas. Okay, Claudius is killed just before Chemas by his wife. This is when Nero comes to power at the beginning of Chemas, right here. Us. Okay, so katos elexato, according to the election of God, Claudius goes down. According to the election of God, we're, we're getting better Bible teaching than before, and of course, according to the election of God, Paul's going to be in prison during this time, which is why he's writing. So it's very evocative for Paul to. He's, these syllables are applying to his own life. They're autobiographical as well. So see, these are the key words. Katos Alexato, Katos Alexato, Claudius goes down. Katos Alexato, Paul goes into prison. Katos Alexato, uh, Nero comes to power. All right, and Nero was a good guy in, his, in the beginning. He, it might have turned out differently. And that is when Christ is 56 years old. See how this is working? Then our next key word, still during Nero, Katabolis, Kazmu. Okay, am I recording? Please tell me I'm recording. I'm worried that I'm not recording. Yes, I'm recording. Good. Okay. Okay. So, Kadabolis is, is founding the foundation. Okay, before the foundation of the world. Well, that was, that was what Rome was considering itself. It was considering itself the foundation of the world, the center of the earth, blah, 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 blah. So, all this is playing on it. And, of course, the fire occurs right here, just before Cosmo, this is where the fire occurs if we're going by Paul's chronology. All right, you can add two years to it if you want, and I do it both ways. I'm really, like I said, I don't know why this is tracking so closely. Um, 
but founding is is something that that Rome was always Rome's own calendar was based on the founding of Rome and that's where I think we're going to be able to solve this problem with the calendar because Roman Catholics treated the founding of Rome as 750 BC um, the Romans treated it as either 753 BC which is three years earlier okay or 748 BC which is two years later than the Catholics and that's why in Roman dates you, you've got to know how somebody came up with his Roman dates which system of the founding the founding of Rome is he using okay that's the calendar was considered ab urbe condita okay from the founding of Rome that was the name of the calendar so you see how pregnant this is and at the Cosmo point we'll say for the sake of argument that's when the the fire occurred or you can say that it was you know technically here and that this has got two years you have to tack on to it all right so that's really so that's our key word here is Katabolis during Nero's time and he considered himself the foundation of everything he's a real jerk at this point all right and then our next key word is Hagius is when the temple goes down temple is Holy. Hagius means holy. Hagias is a vocabulary form. Hagius is accusative plural. Okay? A momus, you have to have blemishless animals offered for sacrifice. Well, the Lamb of God is already in heaven. Okay? And, and this would have been 40 years after he died. That was when the temple was supposed to go down and did. Okay? So that's pretty pregnant. Of course, Nero's dead at this point. This is the, four, the year the four emperors occurs in here. Okay, and this is the time of um, Vespasian, finally, and Titus. Uh, Vespasian will rule until Pompey, which is uh, 79 AD, and then Titus will only survive him another two years. Okay, so this is the time of Vespasian and Titus, and they don't outlast. In other words, they, you have to say they were reasonably good guys, all right, compared to but they were the ones charged with investing in Jerusalem and they didn't last very long all right so the temple Hagius goes down it's very evocative there okay meanwhile the two emperors who were busy you know who were basically had the the role of bringing down the temple whether they liked it or not they themselves you know they only live a couple of years you know to like 81 including Titus all right after that see before him by his standard this is where we left off okay by his standard is the preposition kata and that's why I'm translating it like this you don't see that in your English Bibles but you should they do translate it that way in other verses they ought to translate it this way here so you get the understanding of what it means before him it's not just before him it's before him by his standard okay and it takes the genitive, and that's why it's out too. Okay, so by God's standard, this should have been when the tribulation began, had Christ died on time. All right. And that would have meant that Domitian would have been the emperor, you know, forecast is in Daniel 9.27. Had that happened on time like it should have under the old Jewish schedule pre-church. But church wasn't mature, so it didn't happen. And yet it's still by his standard, because it's his standard, no, church shouldn't go yet. You see? And by his standard, Domitian was the ruler. And by his and by Domitian's standard, church was persona non grata. Domitian was persecuting Christians. I mean, this was a bad, a really bad time, which is indicated by the seven. All right? So it's the kata, the standard. Before him, the ruler, whether it's the mission or God, by his standard, this is what was going on. The mission was in power from 81 until 96. And he dies right here, just after exiling John to Patmos. Okay? So in love, okay, he had foreordained us. That's our key word for this one. Prorisas. Okay? The mission was foreordained to die the year that he exiled John. By means of God's love for justice 
and preserving the human race and preserving our ability to get scripture, which was foreordained to be completed at this point, which it was. You see the wordplay? You see why this keyword works? All right, now you'll notice that we long since departed the time Paul's writing, which is right here. We went into the future here, and we we're into the future all through this. See, Paul's writing here. All the rest of this is future. But you'll notice how it tracks just as deftly to the future that, that Paul was writing about as Paul was tracking when he was tracking to a historical event of Augustus being made curias, being deified. It's the same kind of tracking as if Paul were writing, you know, with, with hindsight rather than foresight. You see how pregnant this is? All right? And so, you know, you're alive, you've got this Ephesians 1 letter, and you know that this is the 73rd syllable, and you see the temple go down. Well, temple's holy. You see Nero, burn, you know, accusing the, the Christians of destroying the foundation of the world, and here you are looking at the text, founding of the world. You see? Domitian exiling and torturing Christians and all that. Yeah, by Domitian standard and also by God's standard. Because when they're tortured and they die, what happens? They go to heaven and they're before God by God's standard as a result of being before Domitian by Domitian standard. And then, pro resus, as foreordained, God completes canon here and he completes Domitian's life here and for all I know he completed John's life too. How long John lived after Revelation, nobody knows. There's a lot of gossip about it in the church fathers, but that stuff is so such garbage, you can't trust it. Okay, and all that was done by love. God's love for justice, God's love for righteousness, God's love for, for um, preserving Scripture, preserving your ability to get Scripture. Okay, and at this point, this is, this is going to be a real killer. At this point, Nerva comes in. Now, he comes in because Domitian was murdered, and the troops that murdered Domitian had two guys sort of at their head who wanted Nerva, who would offer different people the, the toga for empire, and the other people refused it, but Nerva accepted it because Nerva had a vision. Get this. Nerva had a vision that he would be adopted into empire. See? Airship, sonship. Nerva ruled from 96 to 98. So we got, let's say, for sake of argument, four syllables. Ice, hui, yo. That's three syllables. Tes. Okay? Huyotes. That's enough to say son, and he's dead. Or you could say it's only two syllables. I squee. Okay, there's a sound play between son and pig. And the Romans were real big on pig sacrifices. So he isn't around but two years. In 98 AD he goes. Depends on which way you want to count this. If we're counting from 94, you got four syllables. Ice, hui, yo, tes. Got that? And the theme is what? Airship and sonship, that's our key word here. This word here, huyotesian. Now this period in history is known by the Romans, this is their own term for it, as the adoptive emperors. Well, what does huyotesian mean? You're adopted to be a son, and that's the key difference. That's what was remarkable about this phase in history, is that Nerva adopted Trajan Trajan was not his natural son. He adopted Trajan. And then Trajan adopted Hadrian. Hadrian and Trajan were related, but they weren't father and son. So Nerva adopted somebody that he thought was best able. Trajan was the first Spaniard, who, uh, first foreigner who became um, emperor. He was adopted by Nerva. And then uh, Trajan adopted Hadrian. So this period in history, and remember, Paul's writing long before this happens. This period in history is known as the four adoptive 
as the adoptive emperors Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian. Okay, and that adoption theme is what Paul suddenly picks up on. I mean, look, we have all this nice word, oh, he's done this, he's done this. Okay, but the, anything concrete doesn't begin until here. This is concrete. This was very, very important, especially at that in those years, because this was the period of the adoptive emperors. This really meant a lot in the Roman world. This is concrete down here, down now. You don't have to die to get this. You already got it. See, when you were appointed an heir, you know, when Nerva adopted Trajan, Trajan was automatically, you know, in office. He wasn't automatically emperor, but he was, because he was heir presumptive, he had all the duties that you would have on behalf of the emperor. He was like the alter ego of the emperor from that moment forward. All right? So are we through Jesus Christ. You see the meaning of this? See how it's tying to real history? This was the distinctive thing about that history during that time in Rome, is they were adoptive. Huiotesian means adopted as son. Ad adopted as adult son. They were the adopted emperors. Okay? Now, there's more to it than this, and I almost fell over. I thought, well, let me just go look up their biographies, okay? So I pulled out my Suetonius, which is falling apart all over the floor, because I have it in paperback. And one of the other things that distinguishes Nerva and Trajan and Hadrian, who I haven't covered yet, is that they, they had this thing. I don't understand why, but they did. They had this thing about paying attention to inheritance laws, laws about how sons were treated. You know, one of the first things Trajan did when he came to power after Nerva died was he made them deify Nerva, okay, as, an, as a son ought to honor his father. That's what they made, he made them do. He made the Senate deify Nerva, even though Nerva was only around for, what, one year, ten days, and X number of hours. All right. Now, w during that short time Nerva was in office, and during the short, during the much longer time that Trajan was in office, they both specialized in reducing taxes, especially inheritance taxes, and making all kinds of laws about if you're a son or a daughter, there's certain things your fathers were not allowed to do to you anymore. And they made all kinds of rules with respect to sons, okay, sons and daughters. This was a real big thing with them. They were, like, obsessed with it. And um, I'm getting my information on this right at the moment. You can get it elsewhere. From Anthony Burley's compilation, he's a guy who put together the Penguin Classics version of the Augustan history. And the Augustan history doesn't include any chapters on Nerva and Trajan, so Anthony Burley, who's a famous Roman scholar, um, wrote up his own version. Okay, and that's where I'm getting this from. These are the kinds of things he listed, okay, that they were known for doing. Making laws on inheritance and sonship, and making laws on, on how the sons um, can't be hurt by the state and can't be hurt by their fathers as much. The, you know, the fathers were supposed to still be absolute rulers. See, lord and master back up here. But sons had more rights under the, these adoptive emperors. It's really remarkable. I almost, like, died. Now, Ty, um, Trajan's going to end up dying in 117. All right, so this is syllable 114. And I got to get into this because it's going to be really important. So if this syllable 114, we got three more syllables. So it's tutele. That's as far as it goes. Okay, well, that sound play on the verb for telo, it means he wills according to his will. See, per his own delight. Eudokion really means good pleasure. But Paul's making a play on Isaiah 53 um, 10 here which is why I translated delight. Um, and so it's their pleasure, it was the pleasure of Trajan to adopt his kinsman, Hadrian. All right? So it's tutele. 
of what he wanted, of what he wants. That's, you know, how you could translate it in Greek. It's not spelled the way you should spell it. There should be an E-I, all right, instead of an Ada. But it's got that sound play. You get that? So right here is where Trajan dies, all right? And per his own delight, into him, into Trajan, comes Matos, Hadrian. Matos Autu. See? Hadrian was the telematos. Hadrian was the choice of, the will and purpose of Trajan. You see how this is tracking the real history? You see the, the irony of it? Okay? So this is where Hadrian comes to power. Now, Trajan and Pliny were persecuting Jews. All right? But the persecution was less than under Domitian. Okay, and it was a don't ask, don't tell policy. But if you made a stink about yourself, like Justin Martyr did, all right, or not Justin Martyr, but uh, what was it, Ignatius? I think it was Ignatius. Okay, oh, he went to Trajan and said to Trajan, I'm a Christian, you have to kill me now. Listen, it was either Ignatius or Justin Martyr, whoever the guy was, I think it was Ignatius. You know what? If that's what you call a spiritual giant, then there's no such thing as maturity ever. You don't run to a Roman emperor when it's against the law, and when you have this formal law that says, hi, if you're just quiet about being Christian, you can stay Christian, but if you're going to make a stink about yourself, then you have to die. I mean, this is somebody who's looking to aggrandize himself. Whoever Ignatius was, if that's really him who did that, he presented himself to Trajan and said, hi, I'm a Christian, you have to kill me. So Trajan was so sick and tired of this guy coming at him time after time after time. He says, fine, go, fly, go sail to, to Rome and, and get yourself executed in the arena. And then Ignatius takes his very long six-month voyage, writing everybody and his brother in every church saying, Hi, I'm going to die. I'm so glad I'm going to die for God. I'm going to die for God. I'm going to be a martyr for God. And I am such a good person. He's a real jerk. Ignatius was a jerk. Nobody should celebrate him under any condition whatsoever if that was really what he did. Now, my guess is that actually somebody wrote up that story about him and made it up about him because the person who wrote the story couldn't think his way out of a paper bag and didn't realize how he was portraying Ignatius as a jerk. But that's the story about him which you can read in the, the so-called letters from Ignatius. Oh, I'm, I'm on my way now. I'm going, I'm going to, to Rome and I'll die by the lions and I hope they tear me limb from limb. It's awful. That's the kind of policy Trajan had. Don't, 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 don't make a big stink out of being Christian. Just, just observe your faith quietly and we'll leave you alone. So, God left Trajan alone until Tutele. 117. And then into him, into him was baptized Hadrian. And then Hadrian rules during the Bar Kokhba, which you've heard me say so much that you probably want to throw up. So this is the time from here to here of Hadrian. So our key word here is Eudokian. Okay, for Trajan, lasting until Tutele. There is our keyword again. See, you could say the whole phrase really into him because Hadrian was baptized into Trajan, Trajan was baptized in the Nerva by his own Tele, which he wanted. See the cleverness of that? All right, so our, our boy Hadrian is ruling here, and Hadrian was a pretty nice guy, okay? But he did some persecution of the Christians. Again, they had a don't ask, don't tell policy. And a lot of Christians wanted to make martyrs of themselves, so they advertised themselves so that they could be all proud of themselves for being martyrs. It was a really disgusting time in history, as I've already said. All right, now look at this. I saw ton kataten yudokian. Tutelematosautu. This begins an anaphora that I covered in my Trinity Anaphora video. 
But what I didn't tell you then, because I didn't know it until a couple of days ago, was that this anaphora is going to end up running, get this, 33 sevens. Does that ring a bell? 33, Christ's age at, the, at death, 77, double number of God-man perfection, 70 times 7, 490 years. Paul metered his anaphora. Anaphora, it's a neuter term. He metered it. So Paul started getting real specific about our assets in Christ right here. When we're at an all-time low and we're at each other's throats because we're all ticked off that the rapture didn't happen. And he's using the adoptive emperors. This is their time period. And so he talks about airship. You know, he could have mentioned this phrase up here. There's no reason why Paul couldn't have said, into his airship, by means of love he foreordained us. You could reverse these two clauses, and it would still mean the same thing in Greek. But he reserves it for the time of, of the adoptive emperors. You get that? And then he kills, you know, Trajan dies right there. Tutele, according to his will. Yeah, according to God's will, Trajan should die. And according to Trajan's will, Hadrian should pick up the mantle. Okay? Resulting in praise to his glory. That's speaking of God, of course. This is the time of the Bar Kokhba rebellion. This is the time that Hadrian has to put it down. Okay? And it was to the praise of Rome. It was to the praise of Rome that that happened in order to protect the trade routes. Jerusalem was a key commercial value to everybody because it was the nexus of three continents. Didn't matter if she had any resources at all. She, the, the land bridge was key. All right? And it was the praise of Rome to have good roads. It was the praise of Rome to have a stable environment so that there could be trade. That was what made for peace and prosperity. All right? Resulting in the praise of the glory of God's grace, obviously, and Rome's. Putting down the Bar Kokhba rebellion was important because so long as that rebellion was going on, there was no trade. The trade was disrupted because they were, they were practicing banditry and a whole lot of other things against the Romans. All right? So it was really hard to study Bible. It was really hard to get Bible. And in fact, um, just like up here during Josephus' time, you know, this is where a lot of manuscripts were lost, a lot of scripture was lost, a lot of teaching was lost. They, they, Josephus' timelines on, on, you know, from Adam and from David and all that, his timelines are all wrong. He didn't know how to count time anymore. That's how disruptive the, the rebellion was back here during this period. Well, the same thing was true here. So in order for it to be to the praise of the glory of God's grace, God makes it to the praise of the glory of Rome. And this was a very, very peaceful period as a result of Hadrian putting down the Bar Kokhba rebellion. But he was still wrong to go against the Jews, you see. So Hadrian gets put down, and that results in God's grace and glory. Because what Hadrian had done, remember we were back here with Sonship? Hadrian required Antoninus Pius, who was his adopted successor, adopted successor, Antoninus Pius had to adopt two other kids, one of whom would die early and the other one would be Marcus Aurelius. Okay, so Antoninus Pius manages to go on until here. Well, no, like it's one, I want to say it's like 160. So, like here. Okay, and that's where we'll pick up the next time.